With that said, let's now construct a return to libc attack to exploit a buffer overflowing presence of a non-executable stack countermeasure. The vulnerable program I gave you as a challenge at the beginning of the video is very similar to the one that you find in the seed lab. It's configured as setuid root and our objective is to escalate privilege and spawn a root shell out of it. But note that this time we won't need to include some shell code payload in our bad file because we are not allowed to execute any of the bytes we put on the stack anyway. What we want to do is, as we already said, invoke the system function which takes a string and just executes that string and we are going to give it the bin sh as the, as the string, as the parameter to execute. So this will invoke a shell and this is our main goal and lets us achieve privilege escalation. After that, as a kind of cherry on top, we also want to invoke the exit function so that the target program will exit properly instead of causing a segmentation fault that might perhaps raise alarm bells. Now to invoke the system function we need to find its address and that's easy to do. We just run the target program in GDB and we ask the debugger to print the address of that function. Assuming that ASLR is disabled then that address will be the same in subsequent runs and we can use this address to overwrite the return address as one does in the, the standard smash stack smashing step of a buffer overflow attack. Now to do the stack smashing we need to know the offset of the return address with respect to the start of the buffer. As we saw in the lecture on buffer overflow this too is something that we can find out in the debugger. We set a breakpoint into the function that has the buffer overflow and we ask GDB to print the address of the buffer and to print the content of the EBP, the base pointer. Since the return address is the word just after the stored base pointer, then EBP plus 4 minus the address of the buffer is going to be the offset we need. Uh, or in other words, how far into our bad file we need to write the address um, of the system function with which we want to overwrite the legitimate return address. We need to pass a parameter to this system function and it is, as we said, the string bin sh. If we try to write this string at the start of our bad file, then the exploit won't work because the str copy function will stop copying when it encounters the null that's at the end of the string bin sh. And so the buffer won't be overflown at all. One approach that's suggested in your textbook is to put the string in an environment variable before launching the target program because environment variables are passed on to the child process and so uh, it will be accessible from within it and you can write yourself another program that prints out the address where it finds that variable and uh, assuming that ASLR is disabled then this will be the same address where the target program will find it. Now that's not the only possible approach. When I did the seed lab myself uh, I chose instead to put binch at the end of the buffer after the return address that I had rewritten and then I had to figure out the absolute address of the string once it was loaded into memory which meant uh, I needed the absolute address of the start of the buffer and um, the um, in the problem as set in the seed lab that was not difficult because the program was already instrumented to print it out for us so so that uh, we wouldn't waste time repeating things that we had already done in the previous buffer overflow lab. But uh, what should I have done in real life with a program that didn't print out that value? Well, um, this is not quite described in the book, but anyway, the technique of the knob sled that I taught you in, in the previous video, in the buffer overflow lecture, is going to be useful here, but it cannot be applied directly because it needs some slight creative twist. Can you figure out what that is? Can you execute this return to libc exploit with the bin string at the end of your bad file, even if the vulnerable program does not print out the address of its buffer, as the one in the seed lab instead helpfully does. Well, think about it. And if you think you have a good idea, don't just write it down in the comments asking me if it's correct. Try it and see if you can actually make it work in your uh, seed VM. All right, so whichever way you feed the uh, string to your vulnerable program, uh, you put it somewhere in memory and you find the address of the string. Uh, our next problem is how figuring out how to pass the address of the string 
as the parameter to the system function, since we are not invoking the function in the normal way. Uh, as we said, it's usually the job of the caller of a function to stick the parameters on the stack before calling the routine. But here we didn't invoke the system uh, function in the normal way uh, with the call opcode. We just rewrote the ad return address on the stack. So we must set things up in such a way that when uh, we enter the system function, uh, it will then find its parameter in the place where it would have found it if it had been called uh, in the regular way. And we have to be somewhat careful uh, as to where to put it in our bad file. Um, now, um, that's not so bad, but uh, and perhaps a slightly more sophisticated thing is also figuring out uh, what we need to do to ensure that the program exits without crashing. Because uh, we've by now made a mess of the stack, and if we let the system function run to completion and return, then uh, it will end up God knows where, and most certainly uh, will crash, and instead we want it to call the exit function. And finding the address of exit is the easy part. We look it up in GTB just like we did for system, but where exactly do we put the address of exit in our bad file so that it is found as the return address on exit from system that we already kind of messed up in some way. So to answer that, we need to follow step by step what happens when we enter and then exit the system function. And this is one of the things where uh, if someone else is doing it, you say, yeah, yeah, it's obvious, that's fine. Uh, but if you have to reconstruct it by yourself, it's very easy to miss a small step and get hopelessly entangled. So I suggest you close all the books uh, get a blank piece of paper and try to work it out for yourself and see where you get. And the question is, where exactly in the stack will the processor find the return address when exiting system? Uh, and where would it find, by the way, the parameter for system once it is inside system? So pause the video, try figuring it out for yourself and resume once you have an answer. Go on, stop the video. OK, welcome back. I hope you've actually done it. Now, let me do it, and let's see if we reach the same conclusions. So uh, let me draw something. We are inside the vulnerable function, with that, the one that has the buffer overflow. So this is our stack, and um, we are in this function. There's somewhere here, there's going to be uh, the save dbp and above that is going to be the return address and then above that parameters and then below that there's going to be uh, local variables one of which is going to be our buffer vulnerable buffer somewhere here. And then the stack pointer is going to be, um, let me do that in another color. Stack pointer is going to be somewhere here and uh, the base pointer is going to be here. Okay, so we are now inside this uh, vulnerable function and what we do is we um, do we smash the stack, we do our buffer overflow. So we enter some garbage in the buffer that overrides stuff over here. Okay, let's uh, let's call let's give names to the words that start at the EBP. So this word here we're going to call it uh, let's say W X Y and Z. These are the words we want to keep track of because we are going to have to decide in our, this is the bad file, bad file, okay, and we figured out this offset with our usual uh, trick of looking things up in, in, in the GDB, and we want to know, okay, we know the relative positions where we're going to put these things, but what should go where? So let's follow the life cycle of these 
four words uh, throughout the um, exiting from this routine, entering the system, and hopefully also entering the uh, exit function. So um, we can then decide in retrospect where uh, we ought to put various things in our bad file. So we have now uh, executed the uh, the struct copy that has um, overwritten stuff through the buffer overflow. And the next thing to do is to uh, exit this vulnerable function. So we have to execute the epilogue of the vulnerable function, which consists of um, first move the extended base pointer into the extended stack pointer. And so this has the effect of bringing the stack pointer here. Uh, and basically, it uh, gets rid of these local variables. And then the next thing is to pop uh, ebp so that we restore the saved ebp. So popping this into ebp will mean uh, ebp is now w. OK. And um, is, if I pop into ebp, then ESP goes up by one. And ebp no longer points here, because it points to wherever the, the word that we put in w. So I'm going to move this away for now. So that was the, um, uh, the epilogue, which is then followed by a return instruction. And maybe I want to uh, write, uh, let me just make these things uh, extended instruction pointer is, and I'm going to uh, how do I do that? Why does this not delete? Okay. So let's see, okay, this one is now W, and the extended instruction pointer is now. Um, X, and this is what I, what I pop into the instruction pointer when I do a return, is over here. Um, so this gets, this X word gets popped into the instruction pointer, and I resume execution from there. Uh, and so uh, this obviously has to be the uh, address of system. And so I can make myself a note of, of these other things as well in here. So. Uh, W, X, Y, and Z. So this one uh, must be address of system which I found in GDB. OK, so now uh, since um, the instruction pointer is pointing at x, which is the address of system. We are now inside the system, and so we have to run the prolog of um, of the system of the system um, function. And so the prolog uh, starts with uh, pushing ebp on the stack. And so ebp was here; it contained this w. And so I end up pushing w on the stack, uh, which means in this word here. So I'm going to overwrite. Uh, this x with uh, w, and I'm going to move the stack pointer there because there's one more word on the stack. Then, uh, as part of the prolog, I move the stack pointer into the base pointer so that the base pointer now points here. Um, and uh, since I have just pushed the extended base pointer, then this thing. Uh, this thing here, which in our case is garbage, uh, is in fact the saved previous version of the base pointer, uh, theoretically. And so the base pointer rightfully po uh, points at this particular word. And then I have to subtract uh, some amount uh, of uh, space from the stack pointer uh, to make space for the local variables of the routine I'm in, which in this case is system. And so this thing here is the space for the local variable, and that's decided by. Uh, normally, uh, well, it depends on uh, on what local variables the system uh, routine has, but I actually don't care, and so uh, wherever this goes uh, is actually irrelevant for me at the moment. Now, uh, the system function then 
executes, the body of the system function will actually invoke the um, uh, the parameter at the time passing, and so where does it look for its parameter? Well, uh, as we know, uh, the uh, routine expects the word pointed by EVP to be the saved base pointer, the word above it to be its return address, uh, and the word above that to be the first parameter. So this tells us that Z has to be uh, the uh, first parameter. This is where I need to put the address of Binsh. Okay, address of bin sh, I mean the address of the string bin sh that I stored somewhere in memory for it to find later, and you can put it in environment variable, you can put it in uh, the latter part of, of your bad file somewhere over here, and so on. You do whatever you want, but you have to put the address of that string uh, in, now we know, this position here. And then y is the um, return address that this expects to find, and so this means uh, this is where I want to put the address of the exit function, if I want to uh, exit properly. So so that's it. We've now uh, figured out, so w we, we discovered is basically irrelevant. I mean, it's garbage. And we, you know, we put some gar garbage value into the base point and nobody cares. Uh, but these three things, uh, are the things that we need to carry out our attack. The address of system needs to go in x, and x was, x was what? Um, x was, if I remember how I started all this, uh, then this was uh, this place here was where EBP was when I was inside the vulnerable routine. So that's the thing that I can actually look up in in GDB. So the offset between the base of the buffer uh, and EBP is something I can compute uh, in the debugger statically. Uh, and so that's the offset into my bad file where I start with this W, X, Y, Z. So in the first word there, I I don't care what I put. Uh, in the word after that, so this offset plus 4, I have to put the address of system. This offset uh, plus another word plus 8, 8 bytes, the address of exit. And plus another word, plus 12, I have to put the address of my string. And that's basically it. Uh, if we do that, then we, have, uh, we now have uh, arbitrary code execution. Not in the sense of last time of being able to run any machine code that we want, but in the sense of being able to run any executable that is present on the system that we can feed to the uh, system function and with any parameter we like. Uh, and in, in any case, this got us a, a root shell and we even exit cleanly after that, which is as good an exploit uh, as it gets. So if we take a step back and we look at this from a distance, then buffer overflow is a very broad class of vulnerabilities. But buffer overflow can be seen as an instance of something even more general. The programmer thinks that she's the only one writing any executable code, and that the users of the program can only supply some inert data that her code will process. But uh, trouble happens instead when the devious attacker sends the program some data that somehow, unexpectedly, ends up being executed. It was not just uh, inert data after all. So this plainly happens in the kind of vanilla buffer overflow attack that we studied in the uh, buffer overflow lecture last time. Uh, and it also happened e uh, in a different attack that I described uh, in the previous uh, privilege escalation lecture, where there was a, a vulnerable program that was accepting a parameter to uh, user bin cat, and then it was uh, putting the name of the program and the parameter together and executing the resulting string uh, using the system system call, and the attacker was able to persuade the shell to run another command after user bin cat by putting some dummy parameter and then a semicolon and then uh, the real command they wanted. So well, uh, there are many more instances of this very general pattern where the attacker is able to supply something that the programmer thought was going to be just data, and instead it's something that can be executed. And 
In this other video, we are going to study another one called SQL Injection, which was made popular by an often cited XKCD cartoon from 2007. Check out that video if you want to know everything there is to know about the amazing little boy nicknamed Little Bobby Tables and about his even more amazing uber geek mother. Many thanks for watching until the end. To let me know that you did, please include the word coffee mug in the comment down below. The words coffee mug. Have fun getting a root shell with Return to Lipsy, and I'll see you in the next video.